All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to the panel conversation of the Regina Folk Festival in honor of our Web of Life theme. Uh, this panel today is called How Do We Create a Better World? Um, at the heart of today's conversation is our relationship to the land. So I'd like to start by taking time to acknowledge that we here at the Regina Folk Festival are on Treaty 4 lands, home to the Anishinaabe, Nehewak, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota peoples, as well as the homeland of the Métis Michif Nation. And we have guests today. Um, two of our guests are also in Treaty 4. Um, and uh, Kim, where are you zooming in from today? I am joining from Chibuktuk, from Halifax in Mi'kma'ki. Um, and this is the uh, unceded land, um, unsurrendered land of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, the uh, treaties of peace and friendship were signed, um, but no surrender of land um, in Mi'kma'ki. And we just hosted the North American Indigenous Games um, recently too. So a lot of really great energy here right now. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Um, so it's my immense pleasure and honor to, um, to be hosting today's panel discussion. Um, as I mentioned, the Regina Folk Festival's 2023 theme is Web of Life, Music and Community in Harmony with the Earth. And this summer, we will celebrate the natural world and the musicians, people, and groups working to protect it with the goal of encouraging greater engagement with the environmental issues and to, and, and to combat climate dread. So while Regina Folk Festival is a big party, it's a music festival, we work to pay attention to emerging dialogues in the community, including that of the climate emergency, which is a leading concern of our time. And so this year we commit to reviewing the Regina Folk Festival's connection to environmental sustainability and our interdependence with the natural world, with 2023 being year one of our learning. And we have to do this in order to help heal our planet and protect our future. So joining us today are the following special guests. Um, we have Sue Deranger, um, who represents Mother Earth Justice Advocates. Mother Earth Justice Advocates are based in Treaty 4 and are committed to pushing forward the endorsement, honor, and implementation of the People's Declaration of Rights of Mother Earth drafted in Kutkamba, um, Bolivia. As a result, MEJA is involved in education and action supporting this declaration and the Indigenous people's rights that are being violated at the expense of Mother Earth. Katie Wilson is, the indigen is uh, representing Indigenous Climate Action and an Indigenous-led organization guided by a diverse group of Indigenous knowledge keepers, water protectors, and land defenders from communities and regions across the country. Um, indigenous Climate Action believe that indigenous, indigenous people's rights and knowledge systems are critical to developing solutions to the climate crisis and achieving clim climate justice. Kim Fry, is the representative of Music Declares Emergency, a group of artists, music industry professionals, organizations, and music bands that stand together to declare a climate and ecological emergency. Um, music Declares Emergency believes in the power of music to promote the cultural change needed to create a better future. So welcome um, everyone and welcome to whoever is listening and watching. Um, I'd like to start by asking each of you to share a little bit about yourself and the work that you do, and maybe uh, a word for the kind of energy you're bringing into this recording today. Who would like to start? Um, yeah, I can start. Yeah, my name is Katie Wilson. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I'm from Indigenous Climate Action. I'm the digital media coordinator, but um, you know, Indigenous Climate Action is like a, a it, we're a mighty team of, uh, yeah, like, a, I mean, just a lot of really passionate folks. Um, and a lot of the work we do is focus on amplifying the voices of Indigenous people, um, hosting gatherings, um, amplifying youth voices, and um, as well as offering resources and trainings, but also doing this all through, um, frameworks and like hopes and aims towards healing justice. So that's kind of a little bit about the work that I do. Amazing. Okay, I'm Sue Derange. I'm with Mother Earth Justice Advocates. And oh, we are a small but mighty group that was founded in no oh, great peanut is in the background and his name means peanut. Money. Of course, he never barks. 
<laughs> Anyways, moving right along. <laughs> yeah, we in 2010 we started and it started after the meeting in Cochabamba, Bolivia for the it was a big meeting for the protection of Mother Earth and the rights of Mother Earth, which was very exciting. When I first registered, it said there'd be 500 people and it went up to a thousand. And when I was traveling, it said 5,000. And we all waited in this line to register and they finally just came out and registered us. And it turned out there was 35,000 people from 139 different countries all there to protect Mother Earth. And it was so exciting and incredible. And out of that came the Declaration for the Rights of Mother Earth. And it was so awesome because usually you go somewhere, you come back excited and that's that. But they took it right away to the UN and it became law in Bolivia, it became law in Ecuador. And so in 2010, there was another COP meeting in, in Cancun and there was a call out to people that couldn't come to organize locally to talk about the declaration and to promote it. And during that meeting, we said, well, okay, we're here, but let's keep the action going. What can we do? And that, that's where Mother Earth Justice Advocate came from. It said, we've got to do something. And it, and it went from there. And basically, you know, it's, it's to protect Mother Earth. It's to protect indigenous rights. It, 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 it's to bring us all together as, as all humanity of all walks of life of everywhere to say, we're here for our mother earth. She nourishes us, she sustains us. We have to protect her, honor her and, and love her. When I was in Bolivia, one of the most profound things that I heard was from the vice president who, who said, let's tell it like it is. We say we have to protect mother earth, but we're really protecting ourselves. We're here for our own survival because if we, we all die out, Mother Earth will survive and she will regenerate. So let's tell it like it is. We're here to protect ourselves, but our protection relies on us taking care of Mother Earth, protecting her, honoring her and loving her. So I just wanna bring that forward. Like we get into human supremacy and we shouldn't. And, and to remember why we're here. And, and that's one of the things media does. We've done a million things, but I don't wanna take up a lot of time here. So that's basically it. And everybody's welcome that loves Mother Earth to join. Thank you so much. Kim, would you like to share a bit? Yeah, I feel so lucky to be able to be in conversation with, with you and with Katie and Sue. Um, have such respect for the organizations that you're working with and, um, and I think it's, you know, the reverberations of it are felt all across Turtle Island. Um, I, I'm with, um, Music Declares Emergency Canada, and we, um, we started the Canadian chapter in early 2021, um, but it was founded in the United Kingdom in 2019, just a few months before the big global climate strike that, um, took place all around the world. And I helped support the organizers in Toronto. And it was definitely the biggest gathering that I'd ever seen um, between 50 and 100,000 people. And we had a concert with some really incredible musicians, including Lido Pimienta. We had um, Sarah Harmer and we had Wolf Saga. We had um, a group singing a song that Tim Baker wrote, um, my daughter's band. Um, performed she was a high school student at the time and and there was you know like members of Sloan and everyone was like wow we should do something with all of these musicians coming together and supporting climate and so we started to have some conversations about maybe doing something like had happened in the UK um but then COVID uh hit and everything kind of shut down for about a year um right before COVID though a lot of the same musicians we did a International Women's Day fundraiser to raise money for the Wet'suwet'en um, legal fund. And that was, I think, March 7th. <laughs> so it was like right, a lot of people's last concert right before everything kind of shut down. Um, and then we got started again and uh, have a, also a small and mighty team uh, doing a lot of really great work. We've held um, lots of webinars. We held the first ever Canadian Music Climate Summit. Um, we're doing work to green the Junos. We've been working with a lot of festivals, including the Regina Folk Festival. Um, and have just been present at a lot of music industry events, um, trying to talk about the elephant in the room, climate, because sometimes people just don't want to go there. 
Um, so I'm, I would, it's so, I'm grateful, Sue, that you bring up the Cochabamba Declaration because I'm always reminded, just to kind of circle back, that that was born from the Cochabamba Water Declaration, which was born from this attempt by Bechtel to privatize the water in the city of Cochabamba. So it's like this amazing global thing actually came out of a movement that was trying to counter a really bad thing that was happening. And so it's like that idea of like when things seem really bad, you know, and we come together in community and fight it, like all the all the things that can get born from that struggle can be really positive. And that so much of the good happening in the world is is kind of coming out of the communities that are on the front lines of experiencing the climate crisis. And it's not that they're just you know, like victims, which they are to this, you know, to like eco-colonialism, but also are are creating amazing things and innovating movements and like creating a lot of, of the alternatives for the positive future ahead. So it just, yeah, it was nice to be reminded of that. I was involved in some of the water work way back when that happened. So um, so yeah, I'm really grateful to be here and excited for these conversations. It's really important for our organization to center um, land defenders and um, indigenous struggles on Turtle Island and across the world and really see that as an important pathway. So we try to really um, center and amplify the voices of indigenous musicians um, and have uh, worked to, to include a lot of them in the programming that we're doing. Well, thank you so much, um, all of you for sharing. It's such an honor to have everyone here and to be sharing these ideas and histories. And it's just so organic how like, you know, a small group of people come together and it like feathers out and has all these ripple effects and everything, right? I love hearing about these like historical ties and just how there's like these connections even between you folks, you know, here in the panel as panelists. Um, a commonality I've noticed across um, all of your organizations, if not, I think all of your organizations is a creation of guiding texts or declarations in particular, um, Mother Earth Justice Advocates and Music Declares Emergency. Indigenous Climate Action has a lot of excellent writing, especially a lot of articulation about um, indigenous knowledge and uh, ways of being in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, musicians write songs, and the folk festival, uh, we wrote a letter for this year's festival theme on the on our website. People can find it under Web of Life. Um, so, and our theme, Web of Life, was inspired by another declaration, the Suzuki Foundation's Declaration of Interdependence. So, why are these texts important? What, mm -hmm. why texts? Why declarations? I was wondering, where do they factor into all of this? And if anybody wants to speak to that. Well, I'll speak to it because we kind of had a pre-meeting and we went through some of the questions and they're important because like you saw that, that, that web, that what happened in Cochabamba before, during, after, when we put together the media declaration, it was so exciting. We brought people in from Saskatoon and Regina from all walks of life and said, okay, how do you envision a better world? how do we do this and and we went through everything for two days and it was it was exciting and it makes people think and then we crafted it and it was this most beautiful experience crafting it and and writing it and there was just this aura of love and 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 hope and then we brought it back to the people to see if anything was missed and then we put it out and it was very exciting and they serve first of all to get people thinking to to create collectivity and then it's a template it's not the be all end all but it's a template like i when we were writing this i was thinking a lot about the zapatista movement and i had had the honor of going to a community and seeing how powerful it was and and understanding that these are templates because wherever you are your community has different needs and it's autonomous but here's templates to do things. And for a long time, I was hearing people say, yeah, we want to change, but how do we do it? What do we do? And it's like, hey, there's these declarations. There's the Mija Declaration. There's the Suzuki. There's the Red Nation. There's all of these things. Read them. It will guide you. It'll help you have a template to figure out that there is another way. So they're very important. And 
getting the juices going, having something to hang on to to say, hey, I don't have to figure it out. There's a template here. I might change it. I might make it to the needs of my community, but there's something here and there's something I can grab onto. So I think that's the importance for me. Yeah. Thank you for that, Sue. I love that you said that, you know, it doesn't have to be like finished or perfect, right? And certainly, you know, when we, the declaration was that we have, if music declares emergency, came out of the UK. And so it wasn't exactly how we would write it. Um, and we we were like, well, we need to add a little because we have the declaration and then we have commitments under we will. And it was really important for us to add a new commitment. Um, but it was sort of like this idea that people from all over the world are kind of finding some common language and committing to things and that we can then go to people and say, you know, do you agree with these things? If you do sign on and then once people sign on, then you can start to ask them to say, okay, now that you've signed on, what are you going to do about that? And kind of like use it as an entryway for people. And we have, um, we have about 7,000 people who've signed the declaration that Music Declares Emergency has. And, you know, like when we want to get media attention, we'll pull out some of those names. We'll be like, Billie Eilish has signed it, members of Radiohead and members of Coldplay. And people go, wow, you know, like it's impressive. Um, and so I think it's just like a way also of like having that collective power. And I feel like the media, like media tends to, Kind of shy away from talking about the climate emergency as much as it should be talked about and so really just kind of centering it as much as we can and you know like i would like if there was more language about extraction and fossil fuels in there and which like it's not so like explicit but you know we can then use that to have opportunities to speak and then start to like really get into the nitty-gritty of it so it's kind of like um it's a door opener i think and it's also a way of of coming back to like, what is the work we're doing or what is it that we all agree on? And so it can be um, very powerful. I know when I was in Quebec City for the free trade area of the Americas, the group that I was with, which is mostly women, um, kind of like earth-based spirituality. And we kept reading the Cochabamba Declaration, the water one. And we would like go and we would like read it through megaphones and read it all over. And it sort of becomes this uniting thing. And to know that it was global, that we were, you know, bringing it from, from Bolivia. So I think that can be also just incredibly powerful that there, there's these things that people around the world have agreed on. Yeah, and I think just to like add on to like what both of you are saying and just like, um, I think I really like the mention of like the t of it being a template and that these things are like evolving. They evolve as the people want them to evolve and the people say they should evolve because they are also declarations that rely on the voices of the people. What are the values of the people? What are, like, what do we honor? What do we, where do we want to move forward together? I think it's just like, it's also just a really good opportunity, kind of how you both were saying, I just feel like I'm kind of reiterating it, but just like a really great opportunity to like, just imagine together and like have hold space to have these like really creative imagination, imaginations of like what, the world could look like you know mm -hmm. and another thing to consider too is like when indigenous people i mean maybe i'm not speaking i shouldn't speak for all but when i am doing this work it really is with like seven generations in mind so what can you put forward that like can be adaptive for seven generations and and open to hearing the the how our voices change, you know, through that time. So I think they're also just like really great, really great tools for hearing the voice of the people. Yeah. I like um, how declarations and I mean, why not? Maybe, maybe even just bring into the nonprofit world. Um, we're a nonprofit organization at the Folk Fest, for example, even our mission values and our, you know, our like, uh, what do you call it now? Strategic plans and the and the climate plan we're slowly building for ourselves. As an artist, I like to liken it to you know also um, 
it's just important to express these things. You know, it's like it's there's act like it's there's a part of it that's just on a very emotional level important to get you know, as like as ind individuals within a movement or a place just to like like you're all saying like you know to articulate values and everything. Um, Katie, you mentioned the seven generations. In case anybody is unfamiliar with seven generations idea, um, is anybody does anybody feel um, comfortable with uh, with sharing about the seven generation principle and what that is? It's like, I, and if that's okay if not, but it's like protecting the future of like seven generations forward, right? I believe it's an Iroquois, um, sorry, Haudenosaunee. Haudenosaunee um principle okay cool um it is what it sounds like and it's a very smart way to be i think um um so in in speaking about uh um in speaking about um extractive qualities uh kim you were mentioning that you know you wish that there could be a little bit more of that um potentially in the um in the declaration that uh uh, MDE has. Um, I wanted to note, um, this is in the Web of Life letter, but in the book Rehearsals for Living, co-authored by Ro Robin Maynard and um, Folk Festival's guest curator from last year, Leanne Bita Samose Simpson, um, Ma uh, Robin notes how the climate emergency finds its origins in slavery and colonialism, genocide and capitalism. And she outlines how the current climate emergency was not brought about by humankind, which is something that you know people often say or is glossed over but is rather the direct result of European imperialism and an extractive exploitative activities since the Industrial Revolution. Um, why is it important to make this distinction? Would anybody be comfortable speaking to that? I mean, I could speak to it first a little bit. I mean, sure. Um, it's It's so interesting because one of like the main slogans at Indigenous Climate Action is colonialism causes climate change and indigenous rights are the solution. And it's because when we go and we look back at history, the only time we started to feel this need to dominate, to have power, to, uh, um, feel as though we need to basically just have power like it came about through uh, around the time of of colonization and uh you know with colonization comes this these ideologies of like that we can conquer the land that we are somehow not part of the land and i think as indigenous as an indigenous person i feel very very strongly that like we are not separate from the land that we live on you know we rely on the land uh to 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 breathe to drink water like water is life that's not a slogan that's the facts so we we need to understand that like we as sue was saying you know the earth will regenerate herself she needs this but we we have a gift to where we can like we can steward the land. And I think the ideology of colonialism very much removes us from that. It remove it separates humans, humankind from the rest of creation. And, and really what we are is we're all one big web of life and we all rely on each other. So the reason that the climate crisis is even coming to be about is because we feel as through humans feel as though through capital capitalism and colonization and and patriarchy that we we are somehow above not only do we have white supremacy we also have human supremacy we believe that humans are the be all end all and we are the the ones because we have we have we have intelligent thought and opposable thumbs but it's like we are the ones who've created all of this chaos. And if you even look at the land now, she's standing up for herself. Where she's starting to, to resist us. So that, I think it calls into question um, just like a larger 
a larger critique about like how we have discussions about climate because they need to involve the voices of of the land you know so um I kind of went on a tangent there but <laughs> I'll pass it on <laughs> yeah beautiful tangent I love it and and I was doing some research for some curriculum I was kind of sort of assisting with an ICA and I stumbled on articles that said climate change started when Europeans first came here when they they, they started a different way of going through the land and building on the land and more people coming and bringing invasive species in and then it was further exasperated when they were killing the buffalo because the buffalo kept an ecosystem alive and so everything that that's on there is part of an ecosystem that depends on it and if you upset part of it it's going to upset the rest so that's where climate change did start you know so we have to think about that like so often we're just thinking right on, on the present. Okay, well, it, it's extraction. Or some people try to say it's overpopulation and don't get me started about that because we'll be here forever, so I won't go there. But, you know, they blame a lot of things, but it just started with the upset of Mother Earth, the upset of ecosystems. Like Katie said, we're all part of that web of life. Both so eloquent. And if I can just add a little bit, um, I, I always am reminded of an article that David Suzuki wrote where he sort of talks about the failure of the environmental movements for so many decades, not really understanding that um, that indigenous wisdom was like key and that it's like, you know, not even the environmental movement that really matters, but if we do land back, if we allow indigenous communities to have their, their traditional territories back, that because of the like that frame of mind that it doesn't see humans on top then that is the solution and when I was doing um because I worked as a teacher and I was doing some trainings with the Toronto District School Board Urban Indigenous Education Center on treaty education um to bring back to my family of schools and I wish I could remember who said this it's written down somewhere but they talked about how the first treaties were not between peoples or nations or communities, but were people and the land. Because in the David Suzuki article, he talks about like, it's indigenous peoples that have been living in a place long enough that they've made mistakes, they lost their way, and they had to find their way back. And then they had to implement structures and, you know, like, like approaches like marrying science and spirituality, and to build a culture and tradition that would facilitate them living in harmony. So it's not like humans throughout history haven't had moments of like losing their way, but the indigenous peoples around the world have been in that particular place long enough or forever that they've gone through that cycle and that they've got a culture that's built around making sure that they don't do that again. And for non-Indigenous peoples who are like uprooting and moving and settler peoples all over, it's like, oops, oh, well, we goofed, we're just going to pick up and go somewhere else. And that that isn't in the culture. And, and you know, like colonization did start, it sort of practiced in Europe with Europeans and then like went around the world and so like that's one of the reasons why Europe has been colonized for so long and then I think the way out is to look to the indigenous peoples and the their that culture that way of life and to kind of like relearn for people of European ancestry um how to live in harmony so I think that's the really powerful piece that I think the environmental movement didn't get for a really long time yeah, if I could almost add just like one more, th it was kind of like just made me think while you were talking, but like I work in communications. And so I think a lot about the way we, we talk about messages and the way we like tell our story, basically. And colonialism, capitalism, patriarchy, these are all just stories we've mm -hmm. been telling ourselves. They're just narratives that we've been telling ourselves that this is the way humans live on earth that's all they are they're not law they're not the way you know we will always evolve humans will always evolve so um i think another thing that is 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 missing is i think 
people cannot imagine a world where capitalism doesn't exist mm -hmm. or a world where we are living in balance with nature. That requires creativity, a creativity that doesn't, that we just, colonialism and capitalism, just they simply at the root of what they are, they don't understand. They fundamentally mm -hmm. don't understand how to be in right relation with yeah. the land. Yeah. So. Well, and then to connect what you're saying, Katie, to the folk festival, like I think that's one of the reasons why it's so exciting that this story is central to the folk festival and that music festivals and music and like art in all of its forms is an opportunity to create that alternative vision for a world that, you know, doesn't exist in the kind of patriarchal like capitalist and colonial way it's like oh I can see this like other way or like coming together of community and just like the the really amazing vibes and energy that you get at a music festival to be like oh this is a different way of living and so I think that's where art I, I think needs to be more central to climate conversations because it can't just be about like oh doom and gloom and this is the way it is and like looking at all the things we've done wrong it's like well how do we reauthor this new world and some of that is looking backwards like looking back to like you know um indigenous wisdom to um like other ways of being in harmony that have existed around the world but also then like how do we move out of here and I think art offers a really great opportunity for that yeah and when, when you're talking about changing narratives and all these things I always kind of see it as we're caught in the matrix we're not getting out of the matrix and we're in an abusive relationship and oftentimes you're in an abusive relationship you want out but you don't know what's on the other side. So you stay in it. So we're all caught in this abusive relationship and we need to change that narrative. And like Katie says, understand their only stories and change mm -hmm. that narrative and that story and to break free and get out of the matrix. Mm -hmm. Such a beautiful idea, Katie, with the stories. That was, that's so nice. And I think it like, you know, ties to like, yeah, I, and I appreciate the way you, uh, Sue and can you tie that into, um, I'm sure that will resonate with um, a lot of the artists who are listening to this too, you know, and writers and all these things. And a festival itself is a temporary community. It's like its own little world, like you're saying, Kim, you know, like, um, and we have, you know, it, and we, we have this like um, something that we gather around and we, we build, we make new memories um and all kinds of things like this together and uh yeah this conversation hopefully will be a big part of it seeing as it's a theme and some of the guest curated art artists like logan stats and the weather station and shad and abigail lapel will be there for sure sharing their ideas around this um yeah katie actually i'm going to go back to you i was going to say could you describe some of the ways um the different indigenous communities are leading climate change solutions in their communities just as somebody who's often sharing those stories um or talking about it or you know with ica connecting communities do you have any examples mm -hmm. well i think like one of the the main things about like the work that we do at indigenous climate action is we we kind of like go off that template idea in terms of like the people are they're the experts of their of the land and they're the ones who have the the ancestral knowledges that come with that land so like our job is to just help give them the languages help them understand the systems to navigate and also to um give them the, the tools to start building these things for, for themselves. So that's like one of the main, the main um, aspects of like the work that Indigenous Climate Action does is because it's, it's the Indigenous, um, Indigenous sovereignty and Indigenous justice and climate justice, they are all, um re like they all are dependent on the land and so like there's no no one answer so um but yeah examples of it um you know we have a sovereignty and action um award that we give out which um it's kind of open for like 
any indigenous person organization that has like a, some sort of incentive to um, do work in their community. But some people use it to install solar panels on their house. Some people use it to take trainings, land-based trainings, or, um, you know, there's, there's many ways that you can empower people to uh, be leaders in, and in their own communities. And I think like that's kind of like the work that we aim to do is just empower that leadership in people that everyone has, you know, so. That's amazing, important work, of course. Um, Sue, maybe I can uh, pass over to you for a moment, which is just to talk about, I was wondering if you had examples of um, actions in Treaty 4 that you found were powerful um, or, you know, in, in, other areas nearby, if, if you feel if nothing comes to mind for Treaty 4, but I was just curious, like ways that communities have, um, have, have mobilized and taken action in different ways that were for climate. Oh, geez, <laughs> there's, there's lots of powerful things that have happened. Some that were little, some that were big, you know, like we, we, we brought together musicians one time through Mija to talk about the lab and indigenous rights and everything. I, I'm i thinking about, there was a time when they were trying to put nuclear waste up north and the Committee for Future Generations walked from Pine House to Regina and with just a few people, we got community involved and we brought all the groups together. There's so many silos and it drives me crazy and, and we brought everybody together and we raised money to house them, to feed them, to gather people. And, and we had a lot of momentum and people to come and the nuclear waste was stopped. And, and that's just one example. I mean, there's, there's many more like that. It's just, I, I can't think of them all. Even the declaration, like, you know, that was in 2013. And then it kind of went to the wayside. And then during COVID, we had some webinars on it and it, it's inspiring people to, to think about another way. Uh, I've seen communities get together and stop things, you know? So I'm just trying to get my head around all of them and I can because there, there's so many times that people rise up and, 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 and they come together as community. And, and when they feel that community, they understand there is a better way and there is a new system to grab onto. Sometimes it's fleeting and how do we catch that? so that it's not fleeting and we hang on to it. I really appreciate the work of the Comeback Society um, with their land-based education. Um, it's been happening around Treaty 4 and stuff, lots of like cultural knowledge camps and things like that, um, and food sovereignty and all sorts of things. And uh, yeah, it's all interconnected, right? We can't talk about one issue without the other and everything. So um, yeah, um, I, I was gonna ask also um, Kim, um, could you share some actions and, and changes that, um, you know, musicians um, are taking to green their, their, you know, their impacts on the world or even festivals, if, you, if you'd be uh, comfortable sharing? Sure, yeah. I mean, we have, you know, a number of musicians who've come to us and they want to do, they want to tour in a more sustainable way. And they'll say, like, we want to have more sustainable merch, for example, like, where should I order my T-shirts and those concrete things? And those are all really important because they have a huge audience and then they're going to talk about those things. We, um, when Sarah Harmer played here in Halifax, we um, encouraged people to take public transit if they could or to walk or ride bikes and then if they did they could sign up and get put into a raffle like things like that but ultimately we we're also trying not to make it about individual musicians taking on like look at me I'm doing these individual things because we want it to be more systemic it's like how do we change the whole music industry so it's not like a handful of musicians that are doing these actions but everybody how do we make legislation different so one thing we did that I think was really powerful is in 2021 20, December um as there had just been a federal election and you know the new um Trudeau government was coming in we got a bunch of musicians to sign on to it a, a letter that was um, co-authored by Raffi, the children's musician, Caroline Brooks from Good Lovelies, 
and Bridget Fry um, from Housewife. So it's like three generations, like different, not generations, but like different stages in their life. Um, and then we had, I think, 60 different musicians sign on to that letter. And it was directed to the prime minister. And it was about like, we want you to put a just green recovery at the center of your next government. We want you to put in money to like help the arts recover and to transition off fossil fuels and to like have Canada meet its climate targets. So it's like, we're kind of balancing the advocacy piece and using the collective voice of musicians who, you know, some of those are very, we had, you know, members of Broken Social Scene and we had actually Shad and Logan Stat signed on and Leela Gilday and we had um, Fred Panner and other children's musicians. So we had lots of different musicians sign that letter and they're using their collective voice to try and make kind of more systemic change. Um, we're working with the Juno Awards because that's a very visible event that, you know, is televised across Canada. So what are the changes we can make? How do we center climate there? Um, and in terms of festivals, um, you know, the Hillside Festival in Guelph, Ontario is an, an just incredible festival in terms of their operations are incredibly green. They don't have any disposable dishes. So all of the food vendors give your food on reusable plates. You eat your food when you're done you scrape into the compost and then you drop in your dishes. And then they have all these young, like mostly teenage volunteers going around and collecting everything. And they have a dishwashing station and they wash those dishes. So there's very, very, very little waste at the festival. And so that's awesome. There's a solar, uh, the main stage has solar panels, like all of those things are happening. But I think more powerful or equally as powerful is that there's workshops throughout the whole weekend. So there's like a whole thing you can like do workshops on vermicomposting and workshops on, well, how to play the ukulele. So some of them are arts focused workshops on how to build more sustainable communities, workshops of people who want to mm. talk about like collective farming or, you know, mm. all different um, issues around sustainability and there's also a sacred fire and the local um, indigenous communities are, are invited in and they do their own workshops all through the weekend and the sacred fire is there and um, they, they open and close the festival. So to me, it's like, that's also really powerful because there's a real acknowledgement of the land that the festival takes place on and um, and sort of like putting that centrally to the festival. So I think that's a really great model. And I haven't seen a lot of festivals doing all of those elements, but I hope that it becomes a template for, for music festivals going forward. So um, in the Mother Earth Justice Advocates um, Declaration, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's this really beautiful chain of like how uh, where individuals roles for and like you know um, and then the the group's role and then um and then the big you know in the bigger sort of worldview um zoomed out perspective of um, taking care of mother earth um individuals really it's hard to be powerless when you see these you know when you see the devastation that's happening in the climate especially nowadays um where it's the effects of uh, Mother Earth defending herself, as you said, Katie, um, are are more apparent than ever. Um, what about it? Like, maybe I just like want to tease it out, just in case there's anybody who is like, you know, coming to this panel discussion and being like, oh, but what, but what can I do? Like, what are some, is there anything, any kind of wisdom that we can share with people who are like, I'd like to do something, you know what I mean? To um, And what, what can people do? Oh. Well, I was just looking at our media statement and I saw two paragraphs that I think are important. And also when I was getting ready for this, I, I start researching, I start doing things. It's kind of my security blanket. And I stumbled on this quote by Tupac. And let me pull it up because I will misquote it. But it, it really gave me hope because so often we feel like we've done this work for so long and things are changing, but they're not really changing. And some of it's better and some of it's worse. And it, it gets overwhelming. And then I saw this, it said, I'm not saying I'm going to change the world, but I guarantee that I will spark the brain that will change the world. And so if we can all be sparks, sparks make a fire. And that collective is that fire that the sparks have made. And each and one of us is a spark. And I think that's the main thing, not to get overwhelmed by I'm not making 
is not changing and not happening. It needs to change today. It needs to change yesterday. You know, I think that's what's important. And I was looking at these two paragraphs because we made a statement because things evolve. The declaration was written in 2013. And it's interesting because it just started getting momentum. And at that same time, braiding sweetgrass got momentum. And she wrote that in 2013. And it was almost like the world was just ready about two years ago for both of them. So it, it, it's interesting. There was enough sparks that it got sparked. So we wrote a statement because things involved. And I was thinking about these two paragraphs. And it's, today we need each other more than ever. Now is the time to actively build the world we want to live in. A world rooted in our duty to Mother Earth and kinship relationships. The current status quo does not work and does not afford a good life for all. If we take this opportunity to change our values, the negative issues we are facing now, we will afford the colonial system and its narrative the ability to further oppress all creation. There is a power in community. It is time to collectively imagine and co-create a paradigm shift where we are serving, sharing, and caring for each other and the rest of creation. We need to decolonize and empower our communities as we bring forward traditional indigenous leadership models. The time is now. We have two roads in front of us and a choice to make for living in balance and in right relationship with all creation. We all have a duty to honor Mother Earth and create and maintain kinship and family values with each other as humans and the rest of creation. As our deceased elder of Mother Earth Justice Advocates always said, his name was Bob Smoker, and he always said, you're gonna need me as much as I need you. And when we realize we need each other in all creation, then we won't be so overwhelmed. And when we start embracing each other in kinship terms, and we embrace Mother Earth in kinship terms, then we won't be so overwhelmed. And we have to remember that because it's overwhelming, it is. And we always have to hang on to a thread that it's gonna change, that there's gonna be that hope. And, and we've gotta start focusing on successes rather than failures and, and what's going wrong. I love how I, I asked about individuals, what they can do and you reminded me that no one is in a vacuum. It's no, and that's what I'm taking away from. I'm one of the many things I'm just I'm taking away from what you're saying. But it's really like you, like being in kinship. You're not alone. This isn't up to any one person. It could never be. Like once again, these systemic changes are what are, what are needed. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Katie. Yeah. Um, another thing I was going to say, which like, um just bringing up uh, healing justice, which is one of the pathways of um, indigenous climate action. One of the, one of the things about it is um, it asks us to remind ourselves of the work that has come before us and to acknowledge that, you know, especially with, you know, black and indigenous people of color, like our ancestors have been fighting this for a very long time and we're still here you know we're we're st we've we've had this fight before and we've we've done it before and we can continue to fight together you know um and so i think like my what i would say in terms of like just that like what can what can i do but just remember that this this is our collective story you know that it, it it's not up to one person it's not up to um, yeah, it, it's, it's the work of everyone before us and we do it for the work or we do it for the people who are going to come after us, because that's another thing is like, this change is going to happen, but we might not see it in our lifetime, but that's, and we have to remind ourselves of our love for our, our collective kinship with each other our, our our love for this collective care of like I I dream this beautiful world I might not see it but my descendants will see it seven generations from now we'll see it and then when you're also asking yourself to look seven generations ask yourself to look at seven generations of trees of the, the land around you, what is seven generations, planning for seven generations of, of a great redwoods tree 
like, like, you know? So just, just reminding ourselves of this like collective story, basically. I love that. And just, yeah, I mean, as you're speaking, Katie, I'm just thinking about like time, right? Like we tend to think about these short little, like just our, like when I say we, like Western, Western overculture, dominant culture, these like small little bits of time, instead of thinking about time in a much more expansive way. And, um, and that idea of looking, you know, thinking about all the people who've been doing this work seven generations back, who've been resisting, who've been planting trees, who've been growing things and teaching, and as well as looking forward those seven generations. And so I feel like in, you know, of the dominant culture too, so much, it, it becomes focused on individual actions. And there are things that individuals can do, like a really important one is to decarbonize in your home if you can, right? But like, it's also important to recognize that that's expensive. And, you know, it's like very geared towards homeowners. So like switching out, if you have a propane furnace and putting in electric heat pumps, um, or, you know, putting a solar panel on your roof or switching to an electric vehicle, but that's not really accessible to everybody. And then I think it becomes really discouraging when we sort of like, are like, here are the actions that you as an individual can do because they don't feel sufficient or they feel like I can't do that. I don't have the means to do that. And so when we start to look at it as like a collective, like how can our community help get more heat pumps into homes? Or like, how can we do um, deep energy retrofits where we're going to like put in better windows and more and better insulation in a whole neighborhood so that not only are people reducing their emissions, but they're also like have better air quality and better, like more comfortable homes in the like extreme weather of winter and summer. And so like thinking about it as like a collective response instead of like, here's what each individual can do. Cause I think that can end up being disempowering instead of empowering. Um, and then, yeah, like thinking about the, like all of the actions that you can take that you're not going to see the immediate benefits from. Um, and there's a great song, if you don't know him, um, Utah Phillips, who is a, a anarchist songwriter in the U.S., and he talks about building the boat and but not getting to sail it and all these different people through history who were involved in struggle and resistance and movements and they didn't get to sail the boat um, but they built it anyway and I feel like that's like a really great for me it's been a good song to kind of like hold that and know that if you know people have been pushing for change forever and I benefit from all of that work in the past and that doesn't mean there isn't a whole lot of work to do going into the future and so like being good ancestors now is like how I try to I want to be thought of as a good ancestor down the road I think uh it's also it's a it's, it's also um beautiful and speaking to each other um these concepts of like collectivity and uh you know music declares emergency for example um it, you know rate putting together uh, bringing together musicians voices to amplify um some concerns or or to get a message out there to who needs to hear it um i just wanted to note there's a thought i had the other day about artists being this this uh this resource that's it that's exploited um sort of like this um, artist being this renewable uh you know there will always be artists they will always be compelled to create and put music out there into the world and I feel like as um it makes a lot of sense for an organization like music declares emergency to exist because um I feel like you know like any exploited people or you know uh, or um or profession or anything like this um there's some commonality with how the land is exploited as well and stuff. So um, I'm just going to say it's it's challenging um, in a music industry that is very capitalist to to make changes. However, um, I think that a lot of artists also over the last two years have been really raising their voices um, to talk better, uh, talk about um, fair compensation and to talk about uh, you know how expensive it is for them to do their work and how it's not funded enough and things like this. Um, so I just, I just thought I'd put that out there. I don't, Kim, no need to respond <laughs> unless you feel like you feel you can kind of thing, but it's just something I've sort of been thinking about because the music industry um, around the world um, 
you know, in de increasingly devalues music. So if anybody um, is not aware of this, you know, streaming, the, the royalties from streaming music, for example, are so minimal that the average musician or even a professional musician working in Canada sees very little return on it. For one tiny example, you know. Um, yeah, Kim, anything that you feel or anyone who wants to share about that? I mean, I'll just say that I haven't listened to it yet. Um, but I know I've had many conversations with my daughter, who's a musician, who's finding it really, you know, hard to, to make a living. It's, you know, she, and, you know, people think she's doing really well, but, but financially it's been so challenging and she finds that so many of the young musicians she knows come from families where like a lot, there's like a lot of family wealth support to, to doing it. So she sees all the barriers and she was talking about like the writer strike that's happening right now. And she's like, we don't have unions in that way within the music industry. Like there's no collective way we're using our collective voice, maybe around climate, some of us, but there's no collective way to do what's happening of just like withdrawing our labor as a whole. And um, I believe today on the radio, CBC kind of was talking to different people about like, how come the writers can do this or the actors guild, like within film and TV and um, that world they're able to have a strong union and and be collective in that way but in the, in music there isn't so I think it's a really important thing to hold like to hold in mind and to know and which is why we don't want to put too much pressure on musicians who are already struggling and stretched to be like oh and now we want you to spend more money on this or that so that's why we tend to you know say you could do this and that but also like look at what are the systemic changes that need to happen. Um, so I, I hope that musicians can find a way to use their collective power to be more fairly compensated. Thanks for speaking to that. This a little bit of a, like a left, uh, I don't know, curveball or tangent, but but I think related. <laughs> so I threw it in there. Yeah. Um, yeah okay. Well, we are, we are, um, we are having a great, an excellent conversation. And we're slowly like, we're, I feel like we're we're at the place where maybe um, I can ask uh, how what are how do we how do we what are messages of hope um, that you that you as panelists would like to share with our audience today? What are some we we I feel like it's been quite hopeful, but what are other messages of hope? Or are there stories you've heard of hope that um, have been motivating to you today or or in recent days? Something for me that comes to mind, and I, I brought it up a little earlier, but I didn't really like elaborate on it, but it was the notion of healing justice. And that is that, um, and that is not, uh, that was coined by, um, in 20, 2005 by the Kindred Southern Healing Justice Collective. Um, and it's actually a book, there's a book, Healing Justice Lineages that folks can find and it's written by Kara Page and Erica Woodland. And it's just, it's this beautiful, beautiful book that, um, and like, this is what healing justice is, but it's, 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 while we're working towards justice, we also have to be working towards healing ourselves. And that can look, you know, that can look so many different ways. And in particular, it can look um, many different ways for, you know, Black, Indigenous people of color. Like, so um, something I would, I would say in terms of like hope or trying to, if someone was looking for ways to find these connections and um, find the, the interwovenness. Um, I think Healing Justice does a, a really good job of sort of um, talking to a lot of those things because, you know, not only does it, it does that work of asking us to acknowledge, you know, the work of our ancestors and our duty to the future, but it also um, reminds us to, to, to celebrate and enjoy life while it's happening because we, you know, we are only given this, this one life, um, you know, like our, this one, this one body of life. So, so, um, you know, that's another great thing about like music festivals or art or community and coming together. I would say like, we have to come together and heal together. And part of healing is, is, allowing ourselves to feel joy and feel the 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 
just the, the, the celebration of being alive while we are alive on with creation. So um, yeah, I, I think I would just say that. I'll leave it there. Yeah, and to me, hope is, look, the festival is talking about the web of life. You go a lot of places. I've seen books about, you know, being more joyful. I've seen books say, this is what we've done. This changes everything. I think that was Naomi Klein. I heard there's a book out by Maud Barlow that's talking about the hope and the resiliency. And I think we, as long as we hold on to hope that we're okay, as long as we understand that together we can do this and that we're not alone, we're okay. Well, when we bring people together like this, it gives me hope. It's like I meet new people like Kim and I met you, Amber, and it's like, wow, there's more people out there and this is happening and it's being pushed. It's to always hang on to that. We get so caught up in, oh, this isn't happening, that's not happening, oh, no, it's me, oh my God, I can't handle this. But we have to think about, okay, am I going to let that wear me down or I'm going to hang on to the hope that, that there is a better world out there. And I see it happening, you know, like in Regina, there was a homeless encampment in front of City Hall, and it brought community together to hope to help houseless people and, and to feel that community, you know. Years ago, there was an encampment in front of the INAG building that brought community together and people felt that community. It, it's reminding people that there's community because we are social animals. We talk about dogs and everything being social animals, so are we. And when we feel that community, we feel nurtured and we need to nurture one another, nurture the hope and not the bad things. And to me, that's the hope. And that's how we have to take care of one another as we take care of all creation. So beautiful. I, I feel a lot of hope and gratitude meeting, meeting all of you. Can I, I'm gonna share a quote from this book that I'm in the midst of reading called Not Too Late. It's a collection. I don't know if people have seen it. And there's a discussion guide that goes with it, but it was edited by Rebecca Solnit, who's just a wonderful writer, and Thelma Young Lutunatuba. Um, and there's many, many good quotes in here, but this one is by Rachel Cargill. We must offer ourselves and each other space to grasp onto that rest joy, possibility, and freedom now, or we'll grind ourselves completely away, simply surviving the oppressive pressures around us, kind of similar to what you were saying, Katie. And, and I think this book also talks about like that. It's like when we open up our hearts, we will feel sadness. There is like going to be like, instead of looking away or shying away from the sadness, it's like leaning into that sadness and the grief for what we're in, moving through it, and then like seeing with new eyes and feeling the joy and just like beauty and like, like how special it is that our planet like can sustain life. Like the, like, it's just almost mathematically impossible <laughs> that all the things happen that allowed life to flourish on this planet, kind of like hold that miracle. Um, and, you know, to, to sometimes feel sad, but to like feel the emotions, because I feel like what a lot of people are doing, because they're so overwhelmed, is just like looking away and getting distracted and just like focusing on the Ta Taylor Swift Eras tour, because it's a distraction, <laughs> um, then really kind of like sitting with these emotions, but that, you know, through the sadness can come joy. And I mean, back to the music, I think music can take us through those range of emotions and at the festival, there's, there are musicians who, who kind of like evoke some of the, the sadness and despair from the climate emergency, but in those very same records, I'm thinking of the weather stations record ignorance. Also, there's like, uh, like a reveling in the beauty and joy of like our world. And so I think music allows us to feel that full range of emotions. Um, yeah, but so many wonderful things have been said. I feel very grateful and hopeful having met all of you. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'm just want to say one more thing. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I just wanted to say, yeah. Um, thank you, Kim, for sharing that. And like, it just was reminding me again of this, like, we have to also remind ourselves when we're moving through those, like those feelings of grief is that we are living in 
uh, a world and we've we've lived in systems that you know they're very traumatic <laughs> very mm -hmm. violent in inherently and so we all collectively constantly are healing from the mm -hmm. system and it will look different for everyone so you know having and holding that space of grief and also you know having that compassion for yourself that you are moving through a world that you know you are moving through a system <laughs> that you know does not hold this right relation does not have this balance so it's going to be it's going to be a challenge you know and you can yeah, feel that grief and then, and, and, you know, hopefully turn it into, to anger or into action. Um, you know, let, let, let that fuel you. Um, yeah. And I was just reflecting on something that I, I talk a lot about to people that I know. One night I was just kind of feeling like you feel it, you know, this gloom and doom. And I was just kind of had the remote and looking for something I went, oh there's something on the 70s and they were there and they had gas masks on and they were protesting what was happening and they're going the way it's going we're never going to make it to the 80s and I went wow we're saying that right now and mm -hmm. we're past the 80s so there's always that hope that yes it feels like this is it but we don't know when this is it. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it feels overwhelming and it feels like it's there and it feels like there's no way out. But hey, that was the 70s and we're in the 2000s. So there's always that hope. There's that hope that we're going to pull through and we're going to make it with each other. It does feel like the last few years have been a really big, a significant shift in the culture around the world, you know? So I, I feel like there's a lot of, there was a lot of pain and trauma that came over the last few years, um, but a lot of really important breakthroughs, you know, and um, that broke us all open to hear new things and pay attention in new ways to, to, to each other's realities. And um, it's been really inspiring to see all the things that have happened in the last few years in particular. And I want to thank all of you so much for sharing your ideas and your wisdom. Um, and, uh, and I look forward to connecting with you uh, personally after this recording and, uh, and I thank everyone who's been watching this recording um, for their for their time as well but uh, in particular I just want to say thank you um, Sue from Mother Earth Justice Advocates, Katie from Indigenous Climate Action and Kim from Music Declares Emergency Canada so much for your time tonight. Um, are there any last words anything parting words you'd like to share? Well, thank you, Amber, for bringing this together and thank everybody here it's it, it's really been an honor. And usually when I'm speaking somewhere, I always end with making everybody yell, yes, we can. So that's, that's my, my last message. Yes, we can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I guess my parting message would be, um, yeah, we've done this before. We will continue to do this and we will continue to be here. Mm -hmm. I just want to say thank you for making this conversation happen as part of your festival, for making the web of life, the story, the theme, the touchstone for all the work that you're doing, because honestly, that's given me hope. And it's a story that I, you know, I'm telling other people when they're like, well, what's happening? I'm like, look what the Regina Folk Festival is doing. And I think it that's giving a lot of people hope and 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 it's inspiring other corners of, of music. So I feel like there's like a ripple that's gone out from, from what you're doing here in Treaty, Treaty 4. And I wish I could be with you, but I will be there in spirit. So gratitude. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.